Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It's Wednesday, July 14th, 2021, and I'm pre-recording this Trading Places Live for Thursday, July 15th. Futures currently are flat. Um, seem to be a lot more weakness in the market on Wednesday than you might suspect by simply looking at the major indices, a lot of the smaller cap, a lot of uh, mid-cap stocks uh, really being held up by uh, many of its larger cap components or, or counterparts, I should say. Um, and that kind of masked some of the weakness. Uh, I saw a number of stocks that were getting hit pretty hard today, even though when you look at the major indices, not a whole lot was going on. We're going to go through all those numbers in just a minute. But first, I do want to take you over to earningsbeats.com. If you are new to earningsbeats, just want to make you aware that we do have a free newsletter, no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. Simply go to earningsbeats.com and you'll see on the left-hand side an area to enter your name and email address. Hit that subscribe button. You'll be part of our community. Uh, I find the newsletter to be very educational. That's what we, we strive for. Uh, we try to educate about the market, but we also try to educate about our approach to investing at EarningsBeats. I think you have uh, a lot of really good takeaways uh, that you might be able to apply to your own trading or investing. So go to earningsbeats.com, make sure you sign up there. Again, it's free, no credit card required. You can unsubscribe at any time. Um, all right, let's go through the agenda here for today. Uh, we're gonna get into the um, daily market recap, uh, talking technically, uh, growth versus value, July max pain, earnings spotlight, and then we'll wrap up with the three you must see. So I'm gonna start first with the daily market recap. Um, it was a lot worse day in my opinion than what you might have been seeing on the surface. Uh, for instance, Dow Jones finished up 44 points. The S&P was up five. Uh, S&P closed, well, I don't think it closed. It, was, it hit on an intraday basis an all-time high, but I think it closed a little bit below. But still, anytime you're close to an all-time high, you think, okay, this isn't bad at all. Uh, but really what we were seeing outside of some of the largest companies, uh, we, we did see a lot of weakness. So the NASDAQ, for instance, was down 32 points. That starts to show you a little bit of the weakness. Mid-caps down more than one half percent, down 15 points. And then small caps continuing to add to its, uh, uh, just the fact that it's been a laggard now for the last couple of months, but uh, small caps, the S&P 600 small cap index fell 16 points or more than 1%, close to 1.2% on the day. So really not good action. And then just to kind of top it off, the three leading sectors were staples, real estate, and utilities. All three of these are defensive areas. So you got the market trying to move higher, but now all of a sudden money is rotating into defensive areas. We do have options expire on, expiring on Friday, so I think we just need to be a little bit more cautious here in the near term. Um, technology, you know, this one is kind of a head scratcher a little bit because technology led on Tuesday, and it also performed pretty well on a relative basis again on Wednesday, gaining about three quarters of 1%. And the reason I, I look at this as being somewhat odd and surprising is that the last two days, we have had red hot inflationary reports. On Tuesday, the CPI came out um, easily beating estimates. And then same for Wednesday, except this time as producer price index. So at the producer level, we were seeing uh, about a doubling of what was expected in terms of the June PPI and, CP and uh, core PPI. So in that environment where you're worried about inflation, normally growth stocks get hit hard and technology you wouldn't suspect would do well, but yet here it is for the second straight day. And if we combine all the sectors over the last two days with these really hot inflation reports, technology has been the best performer over these two days, which is in my mind, it's a story or a painting uh, of the market that's telling us that inflation is not a problem. The Wall Street does not believe inflation is a problem. But we have short-term options issues. A lot of the market's been going straight up into earnings. We've got earnings starting to come out, options expiring on Friday. And I think that is uh, creating a little financial incentive 
for market makers to take the market lower. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the max pain in just a bit. Uh, energy, on the other hand, really struggling. Crude oil prices uh, now down probably about four, four and a half bucks from, uh, or maybe maybe three and a half bucks. I didn't see where we closed today. But the crude oil prices uh, definitely have backed off of those highs that we saw not that long ago when we were up near $77 a barrel. Uh, we are not at $77 a barrel anymore. I know earlier in the session, we were down at 72 and change. I think we may have closed over 73, but again, we'll look at that chart a little bit later in the program. Moving on to the 10-year treasury yield. Uh, first, let me go through some of the economic reports that you're gonna see on Thursday morning, or maybe uh, by the time this airs, you already have seen. Initial jobless claims expected to come in at 368,000. Last week was 373,000. So we're looking for a very slight drop there. July Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index, June was 30.7. July, we're expecting to drop a little bit here to 28.5. The July Empire State Manufacturing Index, June was 17.4. This time looking for a slight increase to 18.3. And then finally, June Industrial Production and Capacity Utilization. Industrial production expected to rise 7 tenths of 1% in June. May was up 8 tenths of 1%. And then uh, capacity utilization, which was 75.2% in May, that's expected to have risen to 75.6% uh, in June. So that's all the economic reports out. We'll see how that impacts the market. But higher inflation numbers had very little uh, movement interest rates to the upside, which is unusual. Uh, but again, I think that speaks to the point that I was making earlier that I believe Wall Street uh, largely is ignoring inflationary concerns. So you might see it in print. But on the charts, I'm not seeing it at all. All right, 10-year uh, treasury yield here. You can see we've been trending lower below that 20-day uh, EMA. I'm surprised. And if you had told me what these inflation numbers were going to be this month, I would pretty much have guaranteed you we'd have been back up above the 20-day EMA, which is why I never like to give guarantees. Because with the stock market, there's really uh, no guarantee, except I'm going to be wrong from time to time. That's a guarantee. The 10-year uh, treasury yield, you can see, did finish just below 1.36%. And the big move we made up uh, that we uh, saw on Tuesday as a result of the June CPI numbers coming out, uh, essentially, that was given right back. Uh, we saw the 10-year treasury yield drop six basis points on hot inflation data. Again, wouldn't have thought that, but uh, the, the message that's being sent is Wall Street doesn't care. Wall Street believes the Fed, that this is a short-term uh, transitory situation and um, that we're going to uh, have no issues with inflation down the road, that it'll move back toward the target, that 2% target level. And if you recall, it wasn't that long ago, the Fed said they're fine in the short term, allowing inflation to run above the target. So uh, Jay Powell, Fed chair, came out earlier today and said, we're not changing our policy. We don't see anything, any reason to change our policy for quite a while. And I think that kind of calmed uh, the bond market a little bit and a lot of folks um, uh, jumping back in to the bond market and sending the yields lower after that discussion. Um, let's go ahead and move on. I want to talk a little bit about... Um, in talking technically, I want to talk a little bit about the earnings that have come out so far this week. So we're now three days into earnings. Well, technically two days. Uh, JP Morgan came out on Tuesday. And a couple of big banks, Goldman Sachs, uh, also came out on Tuesday. So that was really the kickoff of earnings season. And then earlier on Wednesday, before the market opened, we had Bank of America. We had uh, PNC Financial, uh, Wells Fargo, Citigroup. Uh, a number of those companies also reported. So anyhow, we've been into this now for a couple of days. And so what I thought we would do is just take a look at the RRG chart and see what's going on. Now, one thing I find really interesting when you look at this is that on a weekly RRG, notice that most of these stocks are on the right-hand side of this vertical line. Now, right of this vertical line means that you're showing relative strength. So from a longer term perspective, you'll see that many of these 
stocks that have been reporting this week have shown relative strength going into earnings, into earnings season. Um, and you can see that many of the financials have moved into that weakening. You know, as we've seen the 10 year treasury yield move down, that's taken the wind out of the sails of many of the financials, especially some of the banks. And you'll see all these banks here moving into this weakening area. Now, if, but keep in mind, just about everything's on the right-hand side. Now let's look at a daily chart because when I looked at this, this was a little bit fascinating to me, is that from a daily perspective, this is the kind of the midpoint for relative strength and just about everything's over on the left-hand side. So I think this is a really good sign, a, a good example because it gives you a little bit more sense when you're looking at a daily RRG versus a weekly RRG. The daily, you've got all these banks for the most part, either in the lagging or in the improving, but all of them over on the left side of the chart. We don't have a single financial that's reported over the past two days. None of them on the daily chart are on the right side of the center line in terms of relative strength. Some are moving up in terms of momentum. They've moved up into that improving quadrant, which is above the horizontal line. So it's telling us that momentum has picked up on some of them on a relative basis, but the relative strength has been very weak in the short term. So here's what we need to think about. So on the weekly chart, the question that I'm gonna pose here is all of these banks and financials that are down here in the weakening on the right-hand side of relative strength or the strong side of relative strength, what, what we look for is for this group to turn back up and move toward leading. When you're on the right side of the relative strength line, you even when you start to show a little bit of short-term weakening in terms of momentum, you wanna see that pick back up and head to the upside. But in order to do that, if we go back to the daily chart, we're going to need to see these stocks, these financial stocks move from the left side of the chart to the right side. If we stay over here and roll back over and start moving back down, then that weekly chart, we're gonna see all of those financials moving into the lagging quadrant. So it's, we're kind of at an interesting point here. And when you look at what's going on with inflation and interest rates not moving up with inflation, I would, I would say the only way we're gonna see that interest rate move up is if the market really begins to anticipate that the economy not only has strengthened, but will continue to strengthen because the Fed's saying they're not gonna raise rates. So if there's no, if the market's not concerned about inflation, growth by itself isn't going to trigger higher rates unless the market perceives that that growth is too hot and it'll trigger inflation at some point down the road. But just, you know, better growth by itself doesn't necessarily mean we have to have higher interest rates or certainly not really high interest rates. So we'll see what happens, but this is one area of the market uh, that I think we wanna pay attention to. And I thought the, the, the financials um, were really interesting to look at now that we've seen a number of them report earnings, just how this is shaping up on the RRG chart. All right, so let's move on to uh, growth versus value. One of the charts that I really like, and you know, I'm beginning to see um, maybe a little crack in the foundation of using this IWFIWD chart because it's one that I follow very closely and have been following. But there's one subtle difference between these two ETFs besides the fact one's growth and the other's value. And that is the growth portion is very highly concentrated in just a few large cap um, growth names like Apple, Microsoft, so forth. Whereas the value, the IWD is much more diversified. So no one or even handful of companies uh, will dictate the performance of the IWD the way certain companies will dictate the performance of the IWF. And so I thought I'd, I'd show you a couple charts here, maybe that can help illustrate what I'm talking about. So anytime growth is leading value, I view that bullishly. Um, with a low interest rate environment, GDP rising, growth should outperform value. And you know we've been rising. If you just look at this five-year chart, you can see this ratio has been going up. But we went up so much in 2020, especially throughout the summer, 
of last year that we just needed time to consolidate. It's just like a stock. You know, if a stock goes up this fast, many times it'll pull back and consolidate for quite a while and base before moving higher again. If you want to look at a chart, maybe that's kind of done this a little bit, you could look at a stock like Amazon that went tearing up to about 3,500, 3,600. But then after having a huge move to the upside, we simply sideways consolidated for several months, almost a year before recently just breaking above that level and starting to move up again. So that's what I've been looking for with growth versus value. I wanted to see a move up, some consolidation, and then move up. So I've been looking at this saying, hey, this is good news for the market. IWF's uh, pulling away from the IWD again. But what I found is I want you to look at the relationship with where this ratio is now versus where it was in February when it broke down below the prior low. And the reason I want you to look at that because we've moved back up and we've cleared this 170 level, which I felt was a bullish development. But I want you to, to look at the Dow Jones U.S. growth stocks versus the Dow Jones U.S. value stocks. So essentially, grow, it's still growth versus value. It's just a different view. And if I hit this, we're seeing strength. Notice where we broke down back in February below the prior low. We're not even close to being back up there. So yes, growth has outperformed value over the last month or so, maybe month and a half. But what we're really seeing is that it's the large cap growth that is really helping the market at this point. So again, if we go back here, um, and you can even see it by looking at that relative PPO. You see the relative PPO turning positive and notice if we look at the Dow Jones U.S. growth stocks versus value stocks, we're still down not too far from minus two on the daily relative, or excuse me, weekly relative PPO. So there's a little bit of a disconnect here in that the large cap growth stocks are helping that IWF IWD ratio. But when you look at the small cap growth versus small cap value, we're not seeing that same dynamic. We're seeing some strength, but I would say at this point, I'd probably still argue maybe we're in this downtrend and it hasn't broken yet. I don't know. There's still more work to be done here. But the good news is the overall uh, growth versus value trend is still in play. It's just a question of, you know, have we turned the corner yet? Do we need some more consolidation? Summertime can be a little rough. Maybe we need that fourth quarter to get here before we really start to see the small cap growth. Uh, begin to pull back away from the, the small cap value. Just another something to watch. One more thing I'll show you here, though, is I want to show you the IWF versus this Dow Jones U.S. growth stock index. So let's pull up the same thing, except how are those large caps doing? Now, when you look at this, large caps took off during COVID. When COVID first hit, the pandemic became a problem. The large cap, that's where money flowed. When you're looking at growth, large cap growth versus small cap growth, large cap took off, topped in August, and then went on this free fall for quite a period of time. And now look at it. I mean, we've now got the weekly PPO back, relative PPO back at one, and we're going straight up. Again, let me, let me show you the difference. All right, so here's growth versus value. So yeah, we've gone up gotten back back to this high, starting to roll back over again. Weekly PPO still negative. So small cap growth versus small cap value, not really, you know, showing that much. Um, oh, let me go back. But large cap growth versus small cap growth has taken off. So that's the reason the IWF versus the IWD is looking so strong. It's probably a handful of stocks that's creating that. So if you get rid of that, if you kind of, you know, try to look underneath the surface of this market right now, I'm not sure it's nearly as strong as the indexes are portraying. And I'm, I bring this up because we are getting ready to head into one of the worst times of the, well, the worst time of the year historically, the close on July 17th to the close on September 26th. That's the worst stretch of the year for the stock market, for the S&P 500, dating back to 1950. I've got a spreadsheet. I can back it up. 
forget about going away in May. It's July 17th to September 26th. And here we are. Today is July 14th. By the time you're listening to this, July 15th, we've got a couple more days, but then we move into that period. And so that's why I'm bringing this up. I'm just, I'm still extremely bullish the market long term, but we may need a little bit of a bridge for either some selling or maybe just some choppiness between now and maybe the end of September. And so I'm just throwing it out there. Be careful because there's a, a very concentrated group of stocks right now that are carrying us to the upside. And once they report their earnings, they're doing it probably because of this pre-earnings run that we tend to see. But once we get to a certain area, uh, or once we get to a certain time when these companies begin reporting their earnings, if, they, if we haven't already started going down, I would expect maybe a uh, sell on the news type of event. So just, again, just be careful, cautious. I, wouldn't, uh, I certainly would not be in margin right now. Um, if I was heavily invested in the market, I might consider having some insurance, maybe hedging with uh, an S&P put, if you're familiar with options, possibly hedging by selling calls against your positions, you know, just to at least buffer a little bit to the downside. Uh, that's just my opinion. But the market is uh, teetering here a little bit, and we've got Max Payne coming up. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Max Payne, um, every month you get to a point where the market, you know, generally runs higher got a lot of in the money calls, not many in the money puts. And then there's just a lot of this net in the money call premium that is sitting on the table, leaving some financial incentive for market makers to drive prices lower. So you got to be careful with stocks that have been running for a while. So let me just go through and just show you. Um, and I'm going to pull up, if I can find it. There it is. All right, so let me pull up this um, chart for you, which is, well, the chart list, I should say. So the S&P 500 has been moving up. Short term, if it pulled back to the 20-day moving average, it wouldn't really matter, right? We get that all the time, 20-day test. We just had one a little over a week ago. Well, if we did that right now, we'd be moving back towards Max Payne, which is this um, solid horizontal line coming across here down around 140, or excuse me, 422 level. So the 20 days at 429, now I'm not looking for the S&P to go down to 422, but Max Payne does give us a directional clue. And I wouldn't be surprised to see us moving a little bit you know, in that direction. But let me just show you um, a couple of stocks that I pointed out to our members on Tuesday evening. One was NVIDIA. NVIDIA was trading, I think at around 810, something like that. Yeah, it was down $16. So it was right around 810 on Tuesday at the close when I told members, that, hey, in the short term, NVIDIA could be running into some problems because look at its max pain level way down at seven and the, the max pain level. You can under, under the uh, overlays, put in a horizontal line, put in whatever number you want. So I did that with max pain. So 719.06 is max pain. Once again, I'm not saying that I think NVIDIA will be at 719 by Friday. But what I do think is that it would behoove market makers to short the stock and start to drive it lower um, essentially freeing up a lot of that in the money call premium, net in the money call premium. So they just don't have to pay it. Now they're protected. So if it doesn't go down, it's not a big problem because while everyone's buying calls in NVIDIA, market makers sell the call and buy the stock. It's a covered call strategy. So if we don't go back down, they're not going to get hurt. But if they buy the stock and they make the money on the upside and then they sell that and they start shorting, make money on the downside by shorting, and then all of a sudden the premium starts going away, it's a win-win-win. They can make a lot of money. So that's why you always have to be careful. Um, if we get some news out in the morning, something else about inflation, we could see futures down. I'm just saying it happens. So you want to be careful in the near term with many of these stocks that are deep in the money on, their, on the call side. The other one I'll point out um, is DocuSign. Uh, DocuSign's another one. Printed a reversing candle the other day, pretty close to resistance. And look at the stock pulling back. Look at where Max Payne is down near 260. Stock was down 3% today, $8. That's starting to save a lot of money for market makers. Volume wasn't that great, 
but you might see volume pick up if the 20 day is lost tomorrow or Friday. Uh, one other one I'll show you is, or actually I'll show you these last two, Tesla. You can see Tesla rolling over down more than $15 today. And Zoom, look at Zoom down $17. It actually went down below Max Payne at the close today. So these are all stocks that were subject to potential manipulation to the downside. And we saw it starting today. So just wanted to point that out. Max Payne is something you really need to be aware of. All right, earnings spotlight. I just want to quickly show you uh, upcoming earnings. And I thought I'd put the upcoming earnings Thursday and Friday onto a chart as well, just to look to see you know, what's going on. Right now, this uh, VLRS is doing pretty well. This is an airline. Uh, this has been doing well. CTAS is one that's weakening on the daily chart. But if that rolls back up, I want to show you the CTAS on a weekly chart. Because if this rolls back up on the daily chart and starts to strengthen again, I want you to look and see what's going to happen on the weekly chart. Um, and I'm going to come down here. CTAS, look at where it is right now, moving in a northeasterly fashion, which is bullish, through the improving quadrant and about to break into the leading quadrant. And one last thing I'll show you here on this CTAS is that it recently broke out after all this consolidation. So short term, we're getting a pullback to test the 20. Maybe we get all the way down to about 366 or so. But I suspect we're going to turn back up on that daily chart and on that daily RRG. And I think on a weekly, we're going to break out and start showing some pretty nice strength here on CTAS. Just wanted to point that out. So let's move on now to the three you must see. Um, first up, I want to just show you the crude, uh, crude oil price. I mentioned earlier we were going to talk about this. So here on the weekly chart, we got up to about 77 bucks, And we started rolling over. We got a negative divergence in play. But more importantly, when we look at it from a long-term perspective, we got up to this $77 area, which is where we had topped in 2018. That's a pretty key resistance level. And if we go back to that, uh, I think I said this was a weekly chart. This is a daily chart. Um, but if we look at this daily chart, you see the equal highs coming across and the rising lows. This was an ascending trial, triangle. And we, when we broke out at 67.50, from 57.50 being the low, that measured up another $10 to 77.50. And look at where we just went, almost up to that level. I think we got up just about the 77. So it looks to me like crude oil um, could be in for some trouble. And then... Uh, I think along with that, if crude oil has topped, even if it's just intermediate term top, I think that's going to put a little pressure on the XLE because the XLE got up to about 56, 57, and that also is key resistance. Now the question is, look at this higher high, lower low. This is on a weekly chart, a weekly negative divergence. We could see energy drop back down to about the 45 level, 44, 45. I wouldn't be surprised. So just keep that in mind. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is just the OXY, Occidental Petroleum. Equal highs, Try this. we broke down at about $35 back when the pandemic set in. And now we've just made a slightly higher high, negative divergence right below that 35 level. Watch the 20 week moving average. Occidental Petroleum could be one of those stocks uh, to suffer if we run into problems. All right, that's it. Uh, I wanna wish everyone a great weekend. Uh, next show. For trading places will be over at earningsbeats.com on Monday, uh, and that will be July 19th, um, and that will be starting at 9 a.m. Eastern, so hopefully I'll see you over there. Enjoy your Thursday, Friday, your weekend, and hopefully uh, see you over at Earnings Beats for your next Trading Places Live on Monday. Take care, everybody. Happy trading. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.